Well, good afternoon, Facebook, and welcome to another episode of You've Got the Power. I'm your host, Dr. Jason Deitch, and of course, I'm here with Dr. Chris Centeno, founder of the Centeno Schultz Clinic and the Regenix Network. Dr. Centeno, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Jason. We've got a great topic today. We're talking about ACLs. We're talking sports injuries. We're talking about how some of the world's highest paid highest performing athletes in the world take care of their injuries, both pre-injury in order to reduce their risk of injury and post-injury once something inevitably does happen. Dr. Centeno, let's open it up with ACLs. This is one of, if not the most popular topic when it comes to sports injuries. What do we need to know? Yeah, so the ACL is uh, an internal stabilizer of the knee uh, anterior cruciate ligament. It's, you know, uh, we all see athletes tear these. Uh, there was a basketball guy that that tore one last night. You know, these are the injuries that you see where someone's having a hard time getting up and they're grabbing their knee, whether it's a football game or a soccer game or a basketball game. You know, later you hear that they tore their ACL. Now, this has been the bread and butter of orthopedic sports medicine surgery for quite some time. Uh, The problem is that the research has shown not great things. Uh, So as an example, there's some recent research that shows that when you get an ACL surgery, it's actually a second hit to the cartilage, meaning that the first hit happens when you injure yourself, but then the second hit happens from the severe, crazy inflammation that's caused by drilling graft tunnels, and then all of the carpentry that's required to get that tendon graft in there uh, to act kind of like a ligament, which is what ACL reconstruction surgery is all about. So, you know, we started treating ACLs a number of years ago in 2012, about eight years ago, and really were amazed by the results. In fact, so much so that it's really changed the way we view this injury altogether. Uh, now we can take two out of three patients who used to get ACL reconstruction surgery and instead inject their ACL precisely with stem cells uh, and then have that ACL regrow in situ in the knee based on the MRI evidence that we've collected and then have that person get back much, much quicker. That still leaves about one in three of these that still needs to go to surgery. It is uh, far better if you can heal it and shouldn't be a surprise to many of you if you're watching the program and you keep up with our conversations, you recognize it's really how you think about it that really determines what you're going to do, how you're going to approach it. When I say how you think about it, that means both how you think about it as the individual with the injury but also how your doctor thinks about it. And that's really the key, is aligning your philosophy with a doctor who aligns with your philosophy, which often isn't the case, because many of us don't know the right questions to even ask. We don't know how to push back or question or in any way be sort of hesitant or super curious to make sure this is the right path. ACL surgery is extremely common. Uh, it tends to be sort of the go-to surgery by, you know, every time I talk to, to people, they always, they always love to sort of pull, up, pull out of their sleeve the, I got the best orthopedic surgeon. They're the best. They took care of this athlete or they work with that team. They're terrific. They're amazing. And I'm sure they're wonderful people. But Doc, help us understand sort of the proliferation of this maybe old school consciousness, the, uh, you know, you got to get in there, you talk about reconstruction. Uh, And the reality is, not only does the body have to heal from the injury, it now has to heal from the procedure. It doesn't make much common sense if you're thinking about it. That, of course, is the challenge. Most of us as consumers don't know how to think about it. So, Maybe help people understand why it makes perfect sense that our tissues heal themselves every day, all day, that we're always stressing them to some degree and they're always repairing on a regular basis. That's what our body's job is. Uh, What do you see and, and what do you hope to see in the future as 
Is this just for pro professional athletes? Is this for student young athletes? When is the right time? Who are the right people to basically start looking into this as a possible solution? Yeah, well, we've treated everyone from NFL quarterbacks to uh, to college uh, football players to high school athletes, et cetera. One of the big crazy things in ACL surgeries, we're seeing younger and younger kids get this surgery. So it's not uncommon now. This was very, very rare 10 years ago to see a 13 or a 14-year-old or a 15-year-old get ACL reconstruction. And one of the problems with all of that is by the time that kid uh, 10 years, 20 years down the road is in their 20s or 30s, uh, an awful lot of those kids end up with osteoarthritis in their knee at a very, very young age because of that ACL surgery. Um, in addition to that, you know, when we try to take out that ligament uh, and then we drill some graft tunnels and try to string a tendon through there, the tendon is never really at the right angle. It's not at the natural angle. Um, in addition to that, the ligament had two bundles that kind of cross each other like that, and hence they can uh, stabilize the rotation of the tibia. But, you know, most ACL surgeries are just a single tendon put in there. So automatically we have the tibia that becomes unstable in rotation, even though it might be okay in front and back motion, which is what another thing the ACL does. So long story short is that the Procedures got some real issues. We're seeing younger and younger kids get this procedure. And, you know, obviously, if you can keep your own ligament, that's the way to go. You keep your own proprioceptors, which are position sensors. You keep that natural angle uh, of the ACL. You keep both bundles intact. So the stability is there. Um, so you obviously want to try to keep that ligament, if at all possible. Have you ever had an ACL injury? If you're watching, if you've got questions, maybe you're an athlete, maybe you've had the diagnosis, uh, maybe you don't want to have the diagnosis. What are some of the things athletes need to look for? Uh, how do they, can they kind of self-assess any type of injury like this? Is this always a, wow, it really hurts. I better go to my, is it primary? Is it ortho? Is it my regenerative orthopedist? How should athletes and I'll say parents of athletes uh, be thinking about this in terms of when they need to do what and who do they see when that happens? Yeah, this is usually a, a, an injury that someone knows has happened. A lot of times you'll hear a pop in the knee or the knee gets twisted um, and then it becomes difficult to walk on, swells up. Um, so usually patients have a sense that they've done something serious. Uh, they'll usually end up going to their family doctor. Uh, they'll get an MRI taken. The MRI will come back, ACL tear. Uh, and that's really where I think you've got to stop and think about what your next step is. Because if you go back or if you get referred to an orthopedic surgeon, you know, all likelihood the next step is going to be an ACL surgery where we're ripping out that ligament, we're stringing a tendon in there, doing that big ACL reconstruction surgery. But you've got about a two out of three chance at that point that you don't need that surgery at all, that just an injection will get you back at about half the time uh, to be able to play with your natural equipment that is repaired rather than um, an artificial ligament that kind of works like the initial ligament, but not quite. It's remarkable that that people don't see just how obvious it appears to be. I mean, uh, you know, get back with your own body parts in half the time and two thirds of the time you can avoid surgery, uh, which is going to take much longer and going to really accelerate further issues later on as you age and get older. Most athletes are looking to extend their careers, not shorten them. Um, why do you think it's not more obvious? What do you think all the institutional momentum's about? And, and what are things people can say to their doctors or should they have this kind of conversation with their doctors? Uh, what kind of conversation should be going on so that they can get more engaged in this? Or, or, or will an orthopedic surgeon pretty much go, yeah, no, that's not the way to go. What's your experience with that? 
Yeah, you know, I think that this is such a bread and butter procedure for the average orthopedic surgeon that does sports medicine. It's a tough conversation to have. In fact, um, it's interesting. You know, we're seeing orthobiologics be used more and more. But for this one, uh, orthopedic surgeons are generally not happy about this because this dramatically changes the paradigm from what they're used to. In fact, I had a conversation with a local orthopedic surgeon about this. Otherwise, you know, a guy I know to be extremely rational, extremely uh, level-headed, had a hard time keeping it rational because he was so angry by the concept that we were treating these patients. This was the domain of orthopedic surgery. It should not be uh, anything else. And, you know, I sent him the research that we had done. We published two papers on this. We have finished recruiting a randomized controlled trial uh, that uh, should be done here in the next six to 12 months or so once everyone's through uh, the amount of time we have to follow them up. Um, so it should have been a rational conversation, but it wasn't. Um, and I think it wasn't because this is a, a real big turf uh, thing for, for most orthopedic surgeons. Having said that, I can tell you that two out of three people that are getting these procedures don't need to get them based on our experience, based on the dozens of MRIs we've taken both before and after this procedure. One of the biggest surprises of my life uh, in doing these procedures back in 2012, 2013 for the first time, when no one knew how to do any of this, no one even knew how to inject an ACL, we invented that whole process was really seeing these things uh, come back with, with follow-up MRIs. Um, and, you know, the ACL was pretty much healed uh, and or seeing that same patient back on exam, re-examine the ACL, it's stable, or seeing that same patient go back to what they wanted to do. And about half the time uh, of a surgery, because remember, if you have an ACL surgery, even though surgeons have tried to speed up the time frame a little bit, the more recent recommendations are you're not getting back to what you used to do for a year. That's the current set of recommendations that, that is coming out of the literature right now. Um, so that's a long time to be off of, of doing what you love. It's a long time to be uh, away and, you know, let alone what you enjoy doing. Uh, there are careers at stake in many cases, whether it's scholarships, contracts, uh, you know, ego, whatever it may be, uh, you know, these all work together. Uh, and are there other benefits to orthobiologics? I, I can imagine that if you, you know, tear or injure your ACL, clearly it doesn't only affect that ligament, it, it affects the knee in general. So what are some of the other things that maybe a surgery would not also address that Anybody who's thinking, who sees an injury like that or experiences an injury like that clearly knows that, you know, none of these injuries go directly to one body part. They affect the entire region. What other benefits would there be by using orthobiologics versus surgery? Yeah, I think it's pretty clear these days that uh, while most people have heard about the meniscus tears, they can also happen with ACLs as well as the MCL injury, medial collateral ligament injury. It's also pretty clear that there's uh, in many patients some level of cartilage damage that we don't necessarily see and recognize an MRI out of the gate, but that, you know, then will go bad over time. And then the ACL surgeries, we said, is a second hit to that cartilage. So obviously, if you can use those same stem cells to help your meniscus tear heal, to help your MCL tear heal, to help your cartilage heal, uh, we're hoping that, you know, down the road, 10, 20, 30 years, uh, getting those orthobiologics in there early and skipping that big surgical step that's, again, a second hit to the cartilage really makes a difference for people long term. Do you have questions about your ACL, someone in your family, an athlete you know and love? If you want to know more about uh, ACL repair, the difference between healing and surgically repairing something. If you want to know the difference between understanding how your body can actually heal itself using your own body, uh, the way nature has intended it to, to be. Uh, your body is healing itself throughout the day whenever you're having these micro traumas. 
uh, and it has the ability to heal these more extreme traumas as well. The challenge is too many people are just rushing to the drugs and the surgery. Uh, they've been sold and told, you know, in many cases, a false promise as shown by the evidence, the research and the science that things just don't get to be repaired as quickly and effectively as allowing the body to heal itself. They are completely different pathways. Uh, it may be the similar to the idea of, you know, actually getting out there and practicing and playing versus somebody, you know, false promising you something if you, you know, take a different direction. Uh, Doc, you, you, when you say you invented these things, I guess maybe help people understand what drives you, what motivates you. It seems, you know, I don't know if it, you'd call it risky or different or clearly you, uh, Regenex and Tenno Schultz, uh, doesn't fall into the mainstream mindset, doesn't fall into the, this is the way we've always done it. So that's the way we've always got to do it type of a paradigm. Help people understand, you know, what their thinking should be when it comes to these types of approaches and how and why they can really know that Centeno Schultz is the premier place to go to learn more about these procedures. Yeah, well, we were the in, back in 2012, we were just in a situation where at that point we had been using uh, stem cells to treat orthopedic problems since 2005. So we had a lot of experience. And we literally just had a patient come in with an ACL tear who said, hey, can you help this? Uh, and we said, we really don't know. We're happy to try. Uh, and the patient was like, yeah, just try. Uh, so, you know, that was back when no one knew how to inject the ACL. There was no, you know, there was no way to get a, uh, there's no way to get a, textbook on it or to look it up on the internet. Uh, there was no reason to inject the ACL, so no one knew how to inject the ACL. So, you know, we, we kind of did our best to inject the ACL in that first patient. Um, and over the next couple of years, we, we learned how to inject the ACL because as these patients started to come back, they were telling us they were better. Um, and and then, so then we started getting some MRIs and we started seeing that these ACLs were healing and they weren't supposed to. Um, so then we got, you know, sort of dug in and said, hey, can we really dial in this ACL injection technique? What do we need to do? Do we need to, you know, we got some cadaver, uh, cadavers to dial it in. We started looking at the anatomy, the unique anatomy of the ACL, the fact that it's got two bundles started uh, figuring out how do we inject both bundles at both ends. Um, and over time, we got it all dialed in. But it was literally, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. We had a patient who said, hey, can you help this? And they were okay that it might not work. But they really didn't want ACL surgery. And then over time, it sort of developed into, you know, this is pretty amazing here. This is like totally changing the way these patients are approached because right now this is surgery all day long and twice on Sunday. And yet we're taking two out of three of those people and they're not getting any surgeries at all. Um, and they're going back to sports and half the time. And when we take post, post MRIs, those MRIs look really good. Um, so this is, this is one of those things in regenerative medicine. That's a game changer um, in sports medicine. Um, and I think it's one of the reasons why I told you one of the local orthopedic surgeons was not real happy about this because this is literally, you know, rocking, rocking his world. Um, because, you know, this is 100% of the time you fail physical therapy, you want to get back to playing high level sports, you get this procedure, no exceptions. Um, and all of a sudden, I'm telling him that two and three of those people don't need his procedure at all. That's not good news if you're on, if you're doing the, that procedure. Game changer for the teams. Positive to get back in the game. Game changer for the surgeons, uh, and not a game that they're uh, they like playing. There, there is a momentum to, uh, I'll say, just sort of the status, the revenue, the income. Uh, that goes along with being a surgeon. There's a whole posturing around that and not many surgeons I know and familiar with and, and know personally uh, like to learn much or change much 
uh, if it doesn't come from one of their specific mentors or one of their specific journals. Does that sound accurate to you? Yeah, listen, this is a, a total game changer. I mean, you've got 20 different techniques to repair the ACL uh, that are out there or have been out there through the years. You've got anchors and companies that make those anchors. You've got ACL, you know, tunnel drillers and kits and machines. And so a humongous uh, industry has grown up around these ACLs. Then you've got the hospital or the outpatient surgery center piece in, in that. So this is a big disruptor, right? It would disrupt not only what the surgeons do, but the companies that make all those parts and pieces, plus the hospitals, uh, meaning just taking those ACL surgeries out of hospitals or amateur surgery centers and moving those into physician offices, even if the price of the procedure was identical, uh, would save huge amounts of money. Um, and when I say save huge amounts of money, it means take huge amounts of money away from hospitals. Uh, so uh, this is not going to be a real popular one, uh, a real popular transition if you're involved in that status quo. Our, uh, our regular viewer, Andrew's got a great question. Hey, Andrew, thanks for joining us. Uh, he says, good afternoon. How come professional sports teams aren't doing this? You would think they'd be the first to adopt, but we hear nothing about it. Thanks again, Andrew. Great question. Uh, Doc, we were talking about some articles that have been written about it, but uh, what can you tell us about the sports teams and why they're, so, are they talking positively about it? Are they talking loud enough? If not, why not? Yeah, you know, listen, we have treated uh, at least one NFL quarterback uh, like this. Regrettably, you know, this is a great story because he had started out at a uh, very famous uh, sports medicine clinic, and they tried to do this for him, um, is what he wanted done. So they tried to do this. They did it under ultrasound instead of under x-ray guidance. The doctor doing it didn't know what he was doing, um, so they kind of botched it. And I was asked to come in after the fact, after they botched it. And, um, you know, regrettably, we, we couldn't save his ACL after it had gotten botched by the famous sports medicine clinic. But it was because, I, because again, you know, they, he had wanted this. They had decided how hard could this be? Turns out it's plenty hard to do. do. Uh, you've got to learn how to do it. But, yeah, so the answer is we have done this in NFL athletes. Um, but why is it more isn't it more prevalent? That's because right now that that NFL healthcare piece is controlled by orthopedic surgeons. Um, and while orthopedic surgeons are adopting more and more orthobiologics, uh, I think you were talking about a sports medicine article um, by a really great surgeon that we've sent a lot of patients to, Jim Bradley uh, at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, Jim definitely has adopted tons and tons of worth of biologics, as have other surgeons like Andrews and, and Stedman, uh, who's now retired, but I think it's called the Philippon Clinic in Vail. Uh, you know, again, lots of them have adopted various parts and pieces, but this one is going to be a tough one. Uh, it's going to be a tough one because it so dramatically changes the paradigm. You know, it's one thing to say a knee osteoarthritis patient um, I really can't help, and if I replace their knee, they're too young for it. So I'll let them try stem cells and see how that goes. It's another thing to say two out of the three people I'm currently operating on don't need my operation at all, um, and would be far better off if they did this other thing. That's a bigger pill to swallow. And many of them are not necessarily interested in in learning these techniques themselves because it just continually loses them revenue. I mean, that's basically sort of the common logic uh, for all of it. Um, it. It just seems crazy. I guess, you know, in all of healthcare, this is a really, I think, fascinating question. You, you ask yourself, why aren't there more leaders talking about the things that are innovative? And in many cases, you know, for example, you said this is bad for the surgeons. It's great for employers, right? But the challenge becomes that when it comes to most things healthcare, uh, 
we tend to forget our common sense and we tend to default all information to doctors, researchers, scientists. And there unfortunately is not unanimous consent amongst them, uh, even though the science is the science. Uh, you could put the same article in front of 10 different doctors and researchers and they come to different conclusions and therefore do different things with the information. It's how you interpret the science. The science by itself doesn't tell you here's the only way to think about this and here's the only thing to do. Is that accurate or what, what would be some of your thoughts and explanations as to, you know, how do you have you know, whether it's the government in all types of healthcare issues, let alone leaders in professions that go, well, this is the way we see it and therefore that's the way it should be. But many times they're the old guard. They're not the established ones on the front lines. They may have an, a vested interest in the old way of doing things versus everybody's best interest into the new way of doing things. Uh, what, do, what are your thoughts on how that, how that all works and more importantly, how we're supposed to think about it. We go, there are authorities, but when it comes to healthcare services, people, employers too, tend to go, I don't know, ask the docs, and they forget their common sense. Yeah, well, listen, I mean, uh, we, we've signed on lots of employers and have lots and lots of patients now, about 7 million that have full coverage for this procedure. Um, so that's changing. Uh, and they view it, obviously, as a huge cost savings, because like I said, even if it costs the same and you move it out of the hospital, there's tremendous cost savings by doing that. Now, having said that, you know, it's a little bit like Uber and the cab drivers, right? At the end of the day, we still have cabs. Uh, there's still cabs out there, and there are times when cabs are the way to go. Uh, if you're walking off a plane in an airport, you don't feel like calling an Uber, there's a cab sitting right there in a cab stand and you just take the cab and whatever. Um, now, there are other times where Ubers have taken over pre-pandemic. Uh, and it's the same thing. You know, Uber was disruptive to the cab industry. It didn't make the cab industry go away, but it made it much smaller and, and track. In the same way, this procedure will be very, very disruptive to the sports medicine industry. Um, and there'll still be times when you need that sports medicine surgery called an ACL reconstruction, and that'll probably also be with stem cells, or there's now a, a little device that's going through FDA tri trials called a Bayer, B-E-A-R, uh, device where they're putting it in to try to help regrow the ACL to do what we're doing with an injection surgically. Uh, so there'll still be times when you need to do that surgically, but, you know, that sports medicine world will contract. Uh, the sports medicine surgery world, just like cabs have contracted. Um, and a better mousetrap comes along that's less invasive, cheaper, quicker, uh, et cetera, will eventually uh, unseat uh, what's out there. So it's the same thing. You know, Uber came in, took a little while, but people said, hey, this is much better. I can call this thing. I don't have to call a cab. I know where it is. I know when the guy's coming and how much it's going to cost. Uh, someone's coming to pick me up in their personal car. So I'm not getting into a cab where eight people vomited in the last month, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of benefits and great metaphor. And, uh, you know, that's that's you know, you want the old way, you want the new way. It's pretty much up to you. Uh, let's go to some questions. We've got a uh, question submitted in advance by Jerry Stone. Uh, the question is, I play soccer and have what I'm told is a complete tear of my ACL and a meniscus tear. Have you ever fixed both? Yeah, it's pretty common, Jerry, that we treat both ACL and meniscus um, and many times MCL, because that's another one that will commonly get injured uh, as well. So, so yes, we do treat both at the same time uh, if that's needed. All right. Uh, another longtime viewer, our friend T.O. Kyles. Hello, T.O. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, what's the difference between PRP and PRF? Yeah, so that's a good question. Uh, PRP, platelet-rich plasma, is when we take your blood and we concentrate it. And, uh, you know, if we take out the red blood cells, it looks like an amber liquid. Uh, if we leave the red blood cells in, it looks like thick blood. Uh, now, that's an injectable um, liquid. Uh, PRF is platelet-rich fibrin. 
So PRF is really more of a surgical construct, meaning it's not something you can inject. It's it's you, you basically uh, make a fibrin clot that has a lot of platelets in it, and then you sew that into the area you're working on. Now, interestingly, PRF has not been all that effective in the surgical studies. Uh, PRP tends to be more effective than PRF. Uh, I'm not quite sure why that is. It could be related to the fact that it's only used surgically, whereas PRP can be used non-surgically or surgically. But so far, it hasn't really performed all that well. Very interesting. T.O., thank you for your question. Uh, we've got another question from Jeff. This is a long one, so bear with me. Uh, Jeff says, the office closest to me in North Carolina stopped doing procedures shortly after my appointment was made in March. Now, as I was scheduled for Prolo August 6th and BMA August 18th, I found out the office protocols regarding SARS-CoV-2 and I'm being turned away because I will not wear a mask for this optional medical procedure. That office has lost over 6,500 plus in revenue and I'm inconvenienced. Who is pushing the narrative more? CDC, malpractice insurance, or the doctors doing the Regenex procedures? I'd be willing to sign a no fault in regard to the SARS-CoV-2 to hold the office not liable. Your thoughts, Doc? Yeah, I mean, you have to realize that, you know, that's usually coming from the governor's office. So the doctor being a professional uh, is professionally regulated. So as an example, you know, I went and got my hair cut yesterday. Um, now, barbers are professionally regulated to the Department of Regulatory Agencies, just like uh, physicians. Uh, obviously, it's different. It's a different license, but they're both they both uh, are state regulated. So just getting into the barbershop, I had to have a mask on, I had to have my temperature checked, I had to have, you know, I had to answer screening questions. It was a lot like what we do in our office. We do a lot more things than this uh, Great Clips did. But it was interesting to me. And once I, you know, was halfway through it, I, I recognized that an aha moment. I said, oh, yeah, you're right. These guys are regulated through DORA, just like we are. So they got to do the same things. Uh, so at the end of the day, that stuff's coming through the Department of Regulatory Agencies in that state, and it's just not an option. Uh, they'll close that clinic down in a heartbeat uh, if they catch people in there without masks. So regrettably, that's a reality, and I think all of us um, as physicians understand it all too well, because remember, uh, almost every place we were shut down, our businesses were shut down for four to six or eight weeks, depending on where you were. Um, so no one is going to threaten that. Um, and no one's gonna threaten getting their license pulled because there's someone in their clinic without a mask. So that's the reality and that should be the reality wherever you go, whatever physician's office you go into, whether it's a chiropractor or you go get your hair cut, it's gonna be the same thing. If you're cutting great clips without a mask and someone complains, that barber could lose their license to cut hair the same way that I could lose my license to practice medicine. Jeff's follow-up question is, uh, if a governor mandated differently, no mask required, would Regenex also not require them? I guess that's the assumption, the question that Regenex is not requiring them. So maybe clear up what, what that would look like if the rules changed. Yeah, we require to be done what the local uh, area says. And I realize there's the governor who might say, hey, you don't have to wear a mask in public. That's very different than the Department of Regulatory Agencies who holds that doctor's license and who gives that doctor his or her license, um, who may say the complete opposite of what the governor says. Um, because remember, you know, we're talking about doctors that work in private clinics, we're talking about doctors that work in hospitals and ERs, and, and everything in between. Um, so the Department of Regulatory Agencies might have a completely different statement on what that doctor needs to do versus what the governor says in public. Yeah, uh, Jeff, if you got follow-ups on that, we'd be happy to take them. But, uh, you know, it, it is a matter of, you know, following the law. It's not necessarily your or Regenex sort of political statement or anything like that to go, here's what you want to do. It's Here's what you've got to do to stay in business and comply with the law because 
it's a regulated industry. Is that yeah, now, on the other hand, listen, I, I mean, I've done probably five or six reviews on masks right now, scientific reviews. So I will certainly uh, commiserate with you that um, we don't have much data that, that masks really help. Um, I know that that goes contrary to everything you see in the media, but I've reviewed this research time and time again, um, no less than five or six times since March. And, you know, the research on the mass stopping the spread of this disease is quite poor. So I definitely commiserate with you. Uh, having said that, you know, in our clinic, you're supposed to wear a mask, so you got to wear a mask. Simple as that. So, Jeff, uh, you know, hopefully you can either work with a group who wants to help you. Uh, and I know that uh, we would love to. And if you've got follow up questions, we'd be happy to answer those as you like, uh, either here on the show or you can contact the practice directly as well. Uh, Elizabeth has a question. Elizabeth Yoga Beth Escardo says, my father has bursitis in both hips. Could Regenix help with this kind of pain? Does not need hip replacement. Yeah, Elizabeth. So the good news about bursitis in the hips, and it's really much more tendinopathy. We still call it bursitis, but it's very rare that we see a swollen bursa in a hip. Um, so the answer is yes. PRP usually works great for that. Uh, we treat that stuff all day, every day. Also realize that it can sometimes be overlapped with what's happening in the low back. Um, so you might want to make sure that he sees someone who can go ahead and, and look at both of those things. But yes, we see hip tendinopathy or what's called bursitis. Uh, I, I probably treat anywhere from you know three to ten of those patients a week because it's it's usually part of a bigger picture of lots of other things going on that I'm treating. And I know you had mentioned. Uh, on our last show, you were taking care of somebody who is 90 years old. So there's no real age limit necessarily to this. It's you've always got the ability to heal yourself. Uh, so, you know, if uh, Elizabeth, you're asking whatever age your father is, that should be uh, a, a non-issue in terms of any limitations. Does that sound right? Yeah, the nice thing about PRP as well is you just go up on the concentration. So, um you know, what's really fascinating about tendon cells, which is what we're talking about here, uh, and we actually published this study about two years ago, is that if you take young tendon cells, you really don't need very concentrated platelets. But once you get to older tendon cells, they respond in a direct dose-dependent manner to increase concentration of platelets. So that means that if I'm looking at tendon cells and their ability to repair a lesion, which is called a scratch test, um, I, if I double the concentration of platelets, I get, you know, two times faster closing of that gap, uh, which means two times faster healing. If I double it again, it goes up two times again. If I double it again, it goes up two times again. So uh, older people really respond very, very nicely to very high concentrations of platelets. The problem is that outside of a regenics lab, that's very difficult to do. And as far as the traditional route, uh, usually more seniors are taking more medications. More medications means uh, more possibility of drug interactions, safety issues, and so on. So uh, again, using your body to heal your body is the safest way to go about it. Does that sound, uh, do, do older people who are often taking multiple medications consider that risk in, in sort of this risk benefit equation much? Yeah, you need to realize, uh, again, uh, for older people, here's a good example. You know, you and I might pop a Motrin that's not doing much to our kidneys. Once you get into your 70s or 80s and you pop a Motrin, it can do serious issue, damage to your kidneys. Um, so there's, there are those age-related effects that are magnified in the elderly uh, when it comes to side effects of medication. And that's something to consider. So now's the time. Let's, uh, for those, as we sort of come to an end, we'll take another quick question in just a moment. But for those that may be new to this process, new to this procedure, don't really understand, like, how does this work? Uh, let's talk through just the simple steps. You can either work with uh, Centeno Schultz Clinic or a Regenix affiliate via telehealth or live. 
help people understand kind of what the process is from I'm curious to let's go? Yeah, so so the first thing to do is is to say, hey, I've got a problem. Uh, you can type help in the uh, comments below, H-E-L-P, uh, and uh, obviously we'll have someone get in contact with you. But these days, the nice part is that uh, physicians have had their licenses expanded to all 50 states uh, as part of the pandemic. So that means that you can now get a telemedicine portal just like this with your doctor. That doctor can uh, look at your imaging or order imaging uh, and come up with a treatment plan for you uh, without actually ever having to leave your home. Uh, you can do that locally with one of the Virginics doctors around the country. You can do that with Centeno Schultz uh, and then uh, only go to the clinic uh, to do the procedure. And even that's changed. For instance, at Centeno Schultz, you will, uh, we have a virtual waiting room in your car. So that means that you get to wait in your cars instead of waiting in a room with a bunch of people. Um, and we come and grab you uh, when we're ready for you. Uh, then you're walked into a room with uh, HEPA filtration and UVC viral deactivation that's been medically sterilized with a medical grade uh, disinfectant. Uh, everyone's wearing masks, including uh, I wear an N95 mask all day in clinic. Um, so very different uh, than it used to be, uh, but it's also given patients more opportunity to be able to, to stay in the comfort of their home or if they're at work, not having to leave work in the middle of the day and drive halfway across town to see somebody. So it's much, much more convenient for patients than it ever used to be. And all of that's now covered by insurance, whereas prior to, to March, it would have been very difficult to get United Healthcare to cover something like that. The other benefit I think that people should know is that you, know, you actually really do invest uh, a significant amount of time talking to people to learn about their condition. Uh, one of the most difficult issues most people have is that uh, they're not sure that their diagnosis is accurate. Uh, you go to the traditional system, there's oftentimes a, a small amount of time. People oftentimes expect a prescription or a surgical referral, and you know, you're know you sort of off and done, and docs tend to kick the can either to the drugs or the surgeon. Uh, and they're not usually experts in this particular category. So uh, maybe just pause for a moment and help people understand, you know, approximately what's, what percentage of people actually come to you. They've been to their doctor, they may even been to surgeons, and because of the extra time you spend with people and the digging deep into the questions and physical examination, you actually discover that a lot of people have a misdiagnosis. Of course, misdiagnosis only leads to mistreatment, but you know, if you've got the wrong problem, you're gonna have the wrong solution. Um, so that's one of the things I think is, is different about the Centeno, Schultz, and Regenex approach is that it's, it's not just everything is, you know, a, whatever, a hammer, and so you, everything's a nail, you're a hammer, and it looks the same way. You really invest a lot of time to find out what exactly is going on because there are so many different ways that you can, as you said, affect the concentration and really determine what the most conservative, most effective approach can be. Do you want to comment on that a little bit more? Yeah, I mean, uh, we're going to take a whole body approach. We're going to spend a lot of time with you. Uh, my initial evaluations are usually booked for an hour, um, which is very, very different than obviously going to an orthopedic surgeon who's probably in that same hour seeing four or five patients. Uh, and obviously that gives me the opportunity to, to dive deeper to ask more questions, to get more information, to spend some time looking at the MRIs rather than just reading the MRI report, doing an extensive exam on that person. And yeah, we see lots and lots of patients who have been misdiagnosed um, or diagnoses have really not been dug into like they need to. Uh, and, uh, and then obviously we're gonna approach it a different way treatment wise than you could get at North Big Surgeon's office or that you can get at an interventional pain management doctor's office. But yeah, having that additional time can make a, a tremendous difference. Um, you know, think about it. If you, you know, let's say, uh, no matter what you do, 
uh, let's say I triple the number of interactions you were supposed to have during the day, whether those are meetings with people, whether those are other transactions with people, I suddenly tripled all that. You would certainly know in your heart of hearts that you couldn't do a good job with triple your current workload. You'd have to cut corners. And that's what's happened in medicine, is that as we've forced physicians by lowering their reimbursement to see more and more and more people and hire more and more physician extenders, the quality has gone down, not because these doctors aren't great doctors, not because they're not trying their hearts out, but nobody can can do that workload uh, and still do a great job with everybody. So if you want help, this is the place to get it. As we mentioned before, if you're watching, you can type the word help, H-E-L-P, down in the comments below. You'll receive your free uh, downloadable guide to the Sp Spine Owner's Manual, uh, along with an invitation for more help. Let's get to a bunch more questions in the limited time we have left. Jeff is following up. He says, under what circumstances would bone marrow aspirations be done from different sites instead of one area on the hip? Yeah, Jeff, that's uh, the back of the hip area. The PSIS is the richest site. Um, now, it's possible that, and pretty rare, that we'd have to go to another site. You can go to the front of the hip area called the ASIS. You could even take it from the knee. The problem is the knee has about half the number of stem cells per unit volume as that back of the hip PSIS area. So pretty rare that that we don't take it from the back of the hip. There are multiple different techniques, take it from the back of the hip. So if one's not working, we can use another, et cetera. All right, his follow-up question is, what number of patients want halcyon, nitrous oxide, or none? Yeah, we tend not to use halcyon. Uh, that's a sleeper drug. Um, but, you know, so patients can have either obviously nothing uh, when we're doing these procedures, uh, we can do some numbing and use some cold spray. Uh, they can also take an oral Valium before they come in, or they can have anesthesia, IV anesthesia. And a lot of patients these days opt for IV anesthesia. Um, so they, they get some sleeping medication. Uh, we can usually talk to them during the procedure uh, if we need to, but they don't really remember too much. So one of those three different options. There we go. All right. And then moving on to Arena. Hopefully I'm saying that right. Hi, I'm a Kaiser doc saying that they can do RPRP, but I need to take it three times two weeks apart. I have ACL reconstruction done five years ago and meniscus reduction. Started to have osteoarthritis in my knee with some pain. That's... Um, Saying they need to, uh, yep, her follow-up question is hyaluronic acid. Another question is about hyaluronic acid shots. What's the limit per year in the knee? Thank you. So thoughts on what she's been through and uh, hyaluronic acid shots. Yeah, so when it comes to PRP in the knee, uh, there's a number of different studies that have compared PRP to hyaluronic acid. Uh, PRP is better than hyaluronic acid. As far as how many HA shots can you do, in the knee per year, um, I've never seen anyone do more than, than two or three rounds per year. Not saying it couldn't be done, but you start getting the risk benefit issues because the number of shots, because uh, each one of those hyaluronic acid rounds is either three or five injections. Sometimes you can do the one, but in my uh, experience, it doesn't work as well as the three or the five. Um, and then you've got the issue of uh, PRP in the knee at Kaiser. Again, just realize that you're getting a lower quality product there because they're going to use a little bedside centrifuge, not have a lab. So they're not going to be able to concentrate it to high levels. So it's just a different game than what we can do in a lab. So you're getting something called PRP, but it has a fraction of the growth factors of what we would call PRP. So a little different. That's not saying it won't work. It may work just fine, but but it's not gonna have the same number of platelets in it as a procedure that we perform. And to confirm, uh, if somebody's had re ACL reconstruction in the past, they still are eligible and could potentially benefit from an orthobiologic procedure. Yeah, so, uh, so for PRP, PRP tends to work well 
in mild to moderate arthritis. Uh, if you've had ACL reconstruction in the past, as long as that ACL doesn't also need to be tightened, because that can happen too. You can get graft loosening, in which case that's an x-ray guided procedure of PRP into the graft to tighten the graft in addition to treating the arthritis. So, so again, in, in a Kaiser setting, you're going to get only a simple interarticular injection. They do not have the skill level in order to place that stuff into the ACL graft if that needs to be tightened. There you go. All right. And we will close our show today with Doug Smith, who's saying, wish me luck. We'll have stem cell PRP this Wednesday. Doug, we're wishing you luck, my friend. Thank you very much for uh, the request and thank you for luck. watching. Absolutely. So uh, that's our episode of You've Got the Power, where we are here answering your questions. If you'd like to learn more about your body, the spine, the knee, how to be proactive, you can get all of that information at centenoschultz.com. If you know you want specifically uh, help and you want to read the Spine Owner's Manual, you can type the word help, H-E-L-P, in the comment section below. There's a whole magical technology thing that happens. You type the word and all of a sudden you'll get some information, you'll be able to get the book. And hopefully we've shared with you something that will inspire you to want to reach out for help. Understand that the traditional local uh, access you probably have right now probably doesn't give you the ability to speak to a doctor who is an expert and who excels in this particular category, who understands that taking time to find the right diagnosis so that you can find the right affordable conservative approach to your care is the way to go. So please keep watching our program. You've got the power. If you've got questions, you can always reach out to our offices directly. We've got operators standing by happy to answer your questions. But ultimately, the way to find out if you can be helped is to get on the books and either through telehealth or in the practice, sit down, share your concerns, share what you've gone through, any imaging you might have, and let our expert doctors give you their expert recommendations and advice. That's what we do every day, all day. We're here to help you. You just got to reach out for some help. That's our show for today. So on behalf of Dr. Chris Centeno and everybody at the Centeno Schultz Clinic, we appreciate you watching. We'll be here next week, next Monday, 1210 Pacific time. We're going to be rotating from uh, the Centeno Schultz page and the Regenix page, finding the right rhythm to make sure we're serving everybody. So keep your eyes open. You can make sure that you subscribe to receive notifications every time we go live. So we encourage you to do that so you never miss an episode. Thanks again for watching. Have a terrific week. We'll see you again soon. Until then, stay well and be kind. Thanks for watching.